Please open your Bible with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20. As you are turning there, uh, the last uh, couple of sermons on the rich young ruler really do segue into today's uh, parable or illustration that Jesus gives the laborers in the vineyard. I'm going to read the tail end of last week's passage so we can get the flow of thought, I think, to what Jesus is saying. Just as a little, a little connecting link to look at as I read this, if you look at chapter 19 of Matthew, look at the last verse. You see the, the verse, but many who are first will be last in the last first. That concludes Jesus' discussion with Peter, but it segues into the illustration. Look at the last verse of today's passage, verse 16 of chapter 20, verse 16 of chapter 20, so the last will be first and the first last. So you can see sandwiched between those two statements about the first being last and the last first is today's text. And so it clearly segues out of the rich young ruler into today's passage. So let me start by reading the end of chapter 19 through chapter 20, verse 16. This is again the word of the Lord. We'll start in Matthew chapter 19, verse 27. Matthew 19, verse 27. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world... When the Son of Man will sit on His glorious throne, you who have followed Me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for My name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, They grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity so the last will be first and the first last? Let's pray again together briefly. Heavenly Father, uh, this passage, I think, confronts us in a big way concerning what we think we deserve and how Your grace works in the lives of Your people. So, God, I pray that this text would do as Your Word is promised to do, that it would cut like a sword into our heart, and that it would reveal our thoughts and intentions, that it would show us our need for the grace that is mentioned in this text, and that You would help us to leave God more humbled, less entitled, less prone to complain and grumble, and more prone to be amazed by Your grace pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I've got three points for today's message. I'll go ahead and give you the three points here so you can sort of track along as we go. All of them begin with the words, God's grace. So, points one, two, and three. God's grace, number one, is not distributed on human merit. God's grace is not distributed on human merit. Number two, God's grace is never less than just. God's grace is never less than just. 
And number three, God's grace of eternal life is given equally to all believers. God's grace of eternal life is given equally to all believers. Let's start with point number one. God's grace is not distributed on human merit, and I'll add the words, therefore, be thankful. So, kind of boil the sermon down. I'm boiling the sermon down just as, as briefly as I can say it. Here, here's sort of the main idea for the sermon. And, and th- this is quite a pill to swallow, okay? I, I know when you first hear a, a sentence like this, I can imagine different thoughts. So, let, let me state the, the comment, and then I want to argue why, if we believe this, it's actually liberating and freeing. Here, here's the point, I think, of the text. God has never and will never treat you worse than you deserve. God has never and He will never treat you worse than you deserve. Now, let me just start here, not may, maybe not addressing a Christian who's been a Christian for a long time and maybe has learned this through many painful lessons. Let me just talk to maybe a skeptic or someone who may not even consider themselves to be a believer. You may hear that and say, that is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, you don't understand the kind of suffering I've been through in my life. And while that may be true, it, it may be true that you personally have gone through deep, and horrific personal suffering. There might be things that have happened in your background that I have no idea of that you have worked through for decades, and you are still in the, in the process of working through these things and trying to get past them and work through them. I want, want you to hear, hear me loud and clear. If you could come to the point where you could believe that statement, that God has never and will never treat you worse than you deserve. If you could get to the point where you could say, God has never wronged me, He has never treated me unjustly, He has never treated me worse than I deserve. If you could believe that, because you believe that you are a sinner, just like I am by nature, a sinner who deserves judgment and hell. And yet God has not given me what I deserve. He's given me much better than I deserve. I'm breathing right now in this moment. I am able to hear the gospel proclaimed freely. I am able to receive Christ if I am willing to receive Him in this moment. God is treating me lavishly better than I deserve. But you understand, if you can believe that, that God always treats me far better than I deserve, do you see what it does to your life? what it does to your whole perspective. There's an illustration, Jerry, I may have gotten it from you. I don't, at this point, I don't know where some of this stuff has come from. It may have been you, but, and I've told it before at some point, okay? And this always makes me kind of laugh, okay? So imagine, I told this, I don't know, a few years ago. Imagine you have 100 people showing up at a hotel to spend the night. You got two buses, okay? Did I say 100 people? I'm already messing this thing up. Okay, you got, a, let's say 50 people in each bus. I don't know what I said. I'm already messing up my numbers. Let's say you got 100 people show up, 50 in each bus, Okay, and one bus pulls up to the, to the front of this hotel, and it's a Motel 6. It's not, it's not in the best of condition, okay? And uh, we've all, you've all been there, right? You've all stayed in, in a hotel sometimes. You're like, I don't know why I'm in this room right now. This is not my favorite place. But you, you showed kind of a, not a great looking hotel, and 50 people get out of the bus, and you can imagine, they're going, oh man, this is not, oh, this is awful. This is not what I was expecting. This is not what I was wanting. They're grumbling immediately. They're, I, well, this is, I don't want to stay in a Motel 6. Second bus shows up, 50 people get out, and they start celebrating. They're going, this is the best news I have heard in my life. I cannot believe it. They're just like screaming, jumping up and down. They're celebrating. Do you remember how the story goes? If you've heard this before, do you remember? The first people on the first bus, when they showed up, they were told they were going to the Ritz-Carlton, right? They're they're, they're going to a five-star hotel. They're going to a bed and breakfast. They're going to the most incredible, imaginable situation. They show up. It's a a Motel 6, and they're all going, oh man, this this is terrible. But you remember the second bus? The second bus thought they were heading to the state penitentiary. (laughs) <laughs> they were on their way to life in prison, and the prison bus pulled over and said, you guys are free, you can stay tonight in the Motel 6. And they're like, this is the best news in the world. This is incredible. They go inside, they're hugging the pillows, they don't care how dirty things are, this is incredible, this is amazing, okay? No offense to anyone who works at a, at a Motel 6, okay? <laughs> you're like, I'm a manager, okay, you're killing me here. Uh, so, here's the point of the illustration. Here's the point. The only thing that changed was not the circumstances, Right? Circumstances are completely identical for both groups getting off those buses, right? The only thing that was different was the expectation of what they thought they deserved and what they thought they were going to get. We think we are going to get something great and we deserve it, and you get off and you go, this is awful. We know we are heading toward a very bleak future and we get set free and we're let go here. This is incredible. The only thing that made the difference was their own personal thoughts about what they deserved and what they were to expect. It wasn't the circumstances. And what I would say is, if you can get to the point where you can believe that because of your sinfulness against a holy God, because of the ways in which you and I have both ignored Him, belittled Him, have not turned to Him in prayer on a thousand occasions when we should have, 
thought I can do it on my own, look to my own righteousness, my own supposed strength, and I've tried to measure up on my own. All that is sin. It's a mountain of sin, and we've all done it. And left to ourselves, we are up on the gallows, and the rope has been placed around our neck, and the rope has been tightened, and the little door is about to open under our feet, and we're about to drop into judgment. And imagine if in that moment the rope is cut, someone takes your place and dies in your stead. That's at the core of the Christian faith, that an innocent one would die for the guilty. And if you could understand that God has never treated you worse than you deserve, in fact, Jesus was treated as you deserve to be treated, and you can be treated as Christ deserves to be treated in the gospel, it will completely change how you view the grace and mercy of God. So let's dive in here. Grace is not distributed on human merit. I'm going to read these first verses, and I'll just sort of explain it as we go, because the first verses just need some basic explanation. Start again at verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius, that's a day's wage, a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he goes in, and you look here, he goes in on the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, and then the eleventh hour. So just let me break down what those hours mean. The day started at 6 a.m., okay? 6 a.m. So this is how they counted time in the ancient world. So the third hour of the day is 9 a.m., right? 6 a.m. is when the workday begins. 6 p.m. is when the workday ends. It's a 12-hour workday. So the third hour is 9 a.m. The sixth hour is noon. The ninth hour, 3 p.m. And then the eleventh hour, the eleventh hour is one hour before quitting time. It's 5 p.m., one hour before quitting time. And so this man goes out for day laborers. These are people who do not have committed work. They don't have, they're not employed in some sort of long-term way. They're just looking for work for the day to get by. And if they can get about four or five denarii a week, these coins, if they can get about four or five a week, they could meagerly support a family. Okay, so that's what you're, it's just subsistence work. It's day labor. That's what they're doing. So they're gathered in the market. And this man who owns this vineyard is going out. This may be harvest time. He needs extra hands on deck. He goes out at 6 a.m. There's people sitting around. He says, I will hire you for a denarius, a full day's wage. They agree to it and they go to, they go to work. At 9 a.m., he comes back and hires more. And he says, he doesn't say how much he'll pay them at 9 a.m. He says, I'll pay you what is right. That's what he says. And they agree. They come in. At noon, he says the same thing. At 3 p.m., the same thing. And then amazingly, at 5 p.m., one hour before quitting time, he says, come and work for me. I'll pay you what's right. And he gets more workers. And then the day ends. At 6 p.m., the sun's about to set. Everyone's, well, some of them are exhausted. Some of them aren't exhausted. They've been working for 60 minutes. Okay, so they're, they're different, different groups here. They, they come to this man after all that has happened. And here's where the drama begins to unfold. Let's look back at verse 8. And when evening came, so 6 p.m. has come and gone. We're past 6 p.m. Quitting time has happened. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last, the people who came at 5 p.m., up to the first, the people who came at 6 a.m. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now, just stop there. So you and I, let's say we were hired at 6 a.m. And man, it's hot. And it, it's, like, it's like a Georgia summer day, okay, where, where this is taking place. This is a hot uh, place, and they're working all day. They're going to mention the heat of the day, the scorching heat of the day. They've been working, breaking their back all day long. That's what we've been doing, let's say, okay? We've been working since 6 a.m. And we, we, as we're almost ready to quit, we look over, and some people show up at 5 p.m., right? But the people show up at 5 p.m., and they work for a little while, but it's already, it's already cooling off maybe a little bit. And you know, they're just there for a, an hour, and they quit, and they get paid first. Right? The last will be first. So the, the, the people who work last, they, they show up to get their pay. And you cannot believe, we can't believe our eyes. A full denarius, a full day's wage is given to the people who worked for one hour. So all of us are looking at each other. We're like, you know what this means? This is about to get really good because we worked 12 times as long as they did. We're about to be making some money, okay? We're about to get a couple of weeks' salary right now. This is going to be amazing. And so they're expecting if one hour is one denarius, 12 hours is going to be at least 10, 12 denarii. We're going to get something like that. So that's what they're looking at. And then let's look back at the text. Verse 10. Now, when those hired first, now when those uh, hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house. So let's just start here. here. Here is the first point. Grace is not distributed based on human merit. In this story, it's not saying that grace is a merit-based system, that everyone gets what they, quote, have earned from God's grace. That should be obvious. The word grace means we're getting something above what we deserve. 
So, going back to our opening illustration, if it's true that we deserve death followed by hell, that's what we deserve, every breath is grace, every meal is grace, every moment of enjoyment in this world is grace, and certainly to know the Lord Jesus is the ultimate grace of God. But this is not a merit-based system. It is, not, it is not based on how hard some particular person may work. Let me, um, let me tell a little story here. I don't want this story to distract from the main point, but I think it helps make the point. So just take me one second to explain. So I'll keep the names anonymous, but I, I went to a college uh, for, for uh, kind of under, undergrad in Bible a number of years ago. It's about 15 years ago. And I took a two-week class one winter uh, this is January of 2010, so it was a cold winter and, uh, here in Georgia, and uh, we, I was taking a two-week class on Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. And on, so just two weeks, so we're, we're, we have lectures eight to, eight to noon every day, eight a.m. to noon every day, and then the afternoon you're supposed to be reading whatever you've got to do or working on stuff for the class. It's kind of a crash course. It's, if you're taking a two-week class or something, you know how it's pretty intense as you're moving through it. So, I remember that, I think it was the first Friday of the class. This would have been like January 8th, I think, 2010. I was looking back to see when it happened. And uh, we had a guest speaker come in. And he was an Eastern Orthodox uh, priest, I guess he would call himself, from the local area. And uh, so he comes in to speak. He was wearing a, a black robe. I remember he had a large crucifix, like, around his, like a necklace around his neck. And he had a white, big white beard, I remember. And he comes in to stand in front of our class. And he speaks for a little over an hour. And um, I have to tell you, th this is just a side point. I was just curious to figure out if I remembered his name and where he was from properly, so I, I looked it up on Google this morning, 9.30 this morning, I look it up just to see, like, I was, is this guy still around, what's going on? And this was not what I was expecting, this almost sounds unbelievable. I found, I don't know how this happened, I, I searched the name of my college and his name, and I found on his church's website from 15 years ago, the lecture he gave, and I'm, I'm in it. Like, I, I went and found the spot where I'm talking to him. I'm like, this is mind-blowing. I had no idea this was on the internet, and I found myself interacting with the story I'm going to tell you, so I got to hear it again this morning from 15 years ago. I was like, that is weird. So, um, this is what happened, and uh, he, he, he gave a lecture for about an hour on Eastern Orthodox theology, which is very different from Protestant theology and, and how, I, how we would understand the gospel. And at the end of the lecture, uh, I raised my hand, and uh, I said, uh, I, have a, I have a question. He said, yes. And so, part of what I said was this part that's on the record, but I also, after the class was over, I went up to him, talked to him privately. So, I'm going to sort of combine some things that we talked about here. But he, here's what I said. I said, I believe that we are justified by faith in Christ apart from works of the law. I don't believe that we are justified by anything we've done. And I kind of explained the gospel as best I could for about a minute. And I said, How would, what do you think about that? Like, would you agree or disagree with that? And he basically said, uh, the exact wording, I just heard it a moment ago, I should have written it down. But he basically said to me, he said, you know, if that's what you want to believe, kind of go for it, but that's not what I believe. In fact, if I, if I said, I came here today thinking that as I walked onto this college campus, I was walking uh, to people who were not in the faith. That's what he said. In other words, he has one version of the gospel that is so different, he would actually say that we were not Christians. And I actually respect the man because I actually agree that we couldn't both be Christians because we articulated a very different gospel. And I went up to him after class and I asked him this, and it relates to our sermon text because he mentioned my sermon text today in that conversation. I said to him, I said, Father, so-and-so, I said, well, how would you respond to what Paul says in his letters when he talks about justification by faith? And this is what he said. He said, I believe when Paul says we are justified by faith, he means we are justified by our faithfulness to God. Now, think about how different that is. We would say, no, it's not, it's not by anything I've done. It's not my faithfulness. I look to Christ. I trust in Him, and He takes my sin. He provides my righteousness. This man said, who's, you know, leader of a, at least purports to be a leader of a church, uh, he says, no, 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 justification by faith means justification by our faithfulness, and he listed off a bunch of good deeds. I thought, oh boy. So then I said, what would you do with Romans chapter 4, verse 5, that says, God justifies the ungodly? Says not by works, but God justifies the ungodly, just as David speaks of the blessing to the one of whom the Lord does not impute sins. And so I said, what do you, it doesn't say he justifies the faithful. What does it say? God justifies the ungodly. And he, he didn't quite know what to say, but he said, well, it reminds me of the parable of the vineyard, the laborers in the vineyard. And he tried to argue from my text today that some people, like the people who worked all day, they were justified by faithfulness. They worked all day hard, and they kind of got what they deserved, which is salvation. That's kind of how he was articulating it. But some people show up in the 11th hour, like the thief on the cross, and they mainly get grace. Now, do you see the massive problem with that understanding of the gospel? That's not what this parable is trying to communicate. 
That's not, the, that's not the point Jesus is communicating in this parable, that some people have earned their salvation by working really hard all day, and other people just show up at the last second, and they have a deathbed conversion, and they're saved by grace. But other people, it's a mixture of faithfulness and grace. That is not what Jesus is arguing for in this text. And I think that the, the, the last few sermons in this chapter 19 have made that clear. So what is Jesus trying to get at? Well, let me move here to point number two. Grace is never less than just. Grace is never less than just. It's not distributed on human merit, and it's never less than just. I, I think of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that says, consider your calling, brothers. That, that doesn't mean like what vocation you're, you're doing. It means God sovereignly calling you to Himself, saving you from your sin. He called you to Christ. Consider your calling. Think about where you were in life when God sovereignly saved you. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being would boast in the presence of God. So you see here, what, what Jesus is saying is this. These laborers, some of them have, there's a there's hundred applications. Let me make one application. Someone, say, becomes a Christian early in life, which is a tremendous blessing from God. You become a Christian at five or six or seven years old, and yes, that absolutely does happen. There are false conversions, but there are real conversions for young children. So imagine a young child who becomes a Christian at a young age and lives a life for Christ with passion and zeal, truly honoring the Lord throughout their life. Yes, failing at times, but truly living for the Lord. That person, when they are dying on their deathbed at 95 years old, they, they, they have the comfort of God's presence, they die, and they go immediately into God's presence, and they receive eternal life. And yet, let me tell another story real quick. You may, some of you may know the name John Deans. John Deans used to go to Watkinsville First Baptist Church. He was a passionate evangelist. He, uh, he uh, started the Great Exchange Ministry, which is on campus at UGA. It goes to a lot of college campuses every year, and his wife now is basically sort of help, helping run that. And John Deans had a father who was not a Christian his entire life. And John Deans has an amazing story of going to his dad when his dad was literally dying on his deathbed. This is, I don't know, it was maybe 12 years ago. I don't know the exact time, something like that. And John Deans went to his father's hospital room where his dad was literally within a matter of days. They didn't know how long before he would die. And his dad had deliberately refused Christ throughout his adult life. And now I don't know how old he was. He must have been quite old at the time, maybe in his 90s. And John Deans would sit there at his dad's bedside, and he would start talking to him about Christ. And he's, of course, done that many times. But now his dad knows there's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. Death is coming. The time is short. And so John was pleading with his dad. And over a course of several days, John's dad, and we have reason to believe his dad truly did, put down his rebellion by God's grace and trust in Christ. And he was, it looks like he was saved. It looked like there was a real joy in his, in his dad in those last few days. And then his dad passed away. That's an amazing story. He told it to the whole church years ago. And uh, we just celebrated with him at what the Lord did in his, in his father's life in those last hours. But here's the thing. When, when, uh, when John Dean's father goes to be with the Lord, or when someone who's been a Christian for 85 years dies to go with, be with the Lord, one of them had been a Christian for less than a week. One of them had been a Christian for decades. When they show up in the presence of Christ, guess what they receive? They both equally receive justification. They have adoption. They have the same redemption. They have the exact same eternal life. They have the exact same forgiveness of sins. They are equally saved. Now, th this parable is not meant to teach about rewards in heaven. There are other, Matthew teaches a lot about rewards in heaven and how Christians will have storing up treasures in heaven, not on earth. And there are differing degrees of rewards. I do believe that. But that's not the main point of this text. This text is referring to eternal life, which is what the rich young ruler turned away from. And that's what Jesus just told Peter, you're going to inherit eternal life. And when it comes down to it, it doesn't matter how long you have worked for Christ or how short your life has been with Christ. When you die and meet him, it's not by your merit or not by your actions whatsoever that you stand righteous before him. It's entirely by the work of Christ. So we are equal heirs in Christ no matter what our background is as long as we truly know him. Now remember, anyone who hears that and says, I'm going to put off becoming a Christian, I'm going to wait for my deathbed conversion. I'm going to wait until the last second, and then I'm going to kind of live my life for sin now. And then when, on the last second, I'm going to trust in Christ. Just remember the words of J.C. Ryle about the thief on the cross. J.C. Ryle said, there was not one thief. There were how many? There were two thieves. One of them was saved at the last hour so that none would ever despair. 
Anyone can be saved if they will trust Christ, if they still have breath in their lungs. So the one thief was saved that none would despair, but only one, lest anyone presume. The other thief was too hardened in his rebellion. He never humbled himself. He died in his sin. The other one did not. So don't, don't ever presume, well, I'll always have tomorrow to get right with God. That is not what we are to take away from this. No, today is always the day of salvation. But God never treats us less than we deserve. He always treats us better than we deserve. Now, I know the prodigal son story is extremely familiar, but if you remember here, the prodigal son takes the father's wealth, runs away, extravagantly spends it on, his brother says, prostitutes and parties. He just has this wild life of sin. And then he ends up in the pigsty. He's misery. He's miserable. There's been a famine. He's run out of money. He's got nothing left. He's absolutely miserable. And what's that amazing statement? He came to himself. This is regeneration. This is the Holy Spirit in the parable working in his heart. He wakes up to his state and he says, my father's hired men have better lives than I'm living right here. What am I doing? And he says, I'm going to go to my father. I'm going to tell him how I've sinned. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as a hired worker. And then that, that, that statement, and I hope you never get tired of this statement, while he was yet a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him and said, quick, you know, put my best robe on him, put my ring on his finger, put my, put my sandals on his feet. For this, my son was dead. He's alive. He was lost and he's found. And, you know, we so often end the parable there, but you know what comes in the second act is the older brother. And the older brother says, hey, wait a second. What's this party going on back at the house? And a servant says, well, you know, your brother, your younger, younger brother came back and you can almost see him clench his fist when he hears about his younger brother. And he says, he came back and the father, your father killed the fattened calf which, you know, would have been part of your inheritance. Had, you know, he not come back, you would have inherited that part. We killed the fattened calf, and we're throwing a party because, you know, he's excited. And the older brother becomes furious. Why? What does he say? The father comes out and pleads with the older son and says, son, you know, all that I have is yours. What are you doing out here? Come in. Let's, let's celebrate. And he says, dad. No, he doesn't say dad. He says, look, look, all these years I have served you and you never even gave me so much as a young goat that I, might party, that I might have a party with my friends. When this evil son of yours, you know, this son of yours comes who's squandered all your living on riotous living, you kill the fattened calf for him. He is furious. What's, what's wrong here? He is thinking the way some of the laborers in this story are thinking. He's thinking, I've worked hard. I've been here the whole time, and I've earned something from you, Father. He has wasted everything. He deserves nothing. And he, again, is thinking in terms of merit. He is thinking in terms of what he deserves. But the father says, no, come in and celebrate this party with me. See, grace is not distributed based on merit. Let's just, let me just say one more thing here. You may know someone who the Lord has given gifts to in this life, gifting that you don't have in some area. And you go, man, I wish I could do something the way this person does it. They are so gifted in that area. And there might be a temptation to be jealous or to wish that you had the gifting that they had. But God gives gifts not based on merit. Or it might look like this. You might say, I have worked just as hard, if not harder, than this other person in this area. I have slaved away. Sounds like the older brother. I've been a slave. I've been working as hard as I could in this area. And yet this other person seems to be outwardly so much more fruitful, so much more blessed by God than, than I have been. Why is that? I mean, what have I done different than this other person? If anything, I've worked harder than they have. I've been more committed than they have. And Jesus would say, deep down, underneath what's going on, he would say, deep down, you are starting to treat your relationship with God based on how you think you deserve, how you've worked, what you, what you think you are owed, when instead we should see that all of life is a gift of grace. So we should be thankful and we should not grumble. We've never received less than we deserve. Point number three, God's grace of eternal life is given equally to all believers the first and the last. So we should not begrudge God's grace as it's, as it's given to others. Let me, let me read here again. Look with me back at verse, I'm going to reread a little bit, verse 10. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? Literally, is your eye evil because I am good? 
Is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Let me uh, give an illustration again. I know this is going to be familiar to some of you. Uh, R.C. Sproul uh, went to heaven back, I think, in late 2017, and he, wa- he obviously taught, uh, and we've benefited from him, many of us, his podcast, his teaching, his books. Uh, R.C. Sproul is a gift to the church, and uh, R.C. Sproul talks about when he was first teaching uh, at college. This is back, this must have been in the 70s, I don't know the exact time, and he was teaching a freshman class, and he said he had for the freshman, let's, I don't know the exact numbers, let's say he had about 200 people in his freshman class, and he had uh, term paper due, and one was due per month throughout the semester. So he had one due, say, September 20th, October 20th, November 20th. I don't know if I'm getting those right, but something like that. You know, one a month, and they're due. And he said, listen, here's the one big rule I have for this, for this paper. You cannot turn it in late, okay? Unless you are, you know, in the hospital or there's been a death of a loved one in your immediate family, you cannot turn this in late. If you turn it in one hour late, one minute late, you will get an automatic F and a zero on this paper. Is that clear? And all 200 of his students said, yes, sir, that is clear. So they get to September 20th, and the first paper is due, and he says about 175 students show up with their papers ready to go, and there's this small group of terrified students in the corner of the classroom, uh, and they're all, they're all nervous. R.C. Sproul said, you know, decades later, he was at a conference, and one guy came up to him after he talked and said, hey, I was in that class. I remember when this happened. I was one of, those, one of the guys in that class back in the 70s when this happened. So about 25 students don't have their paper, and they're all terrified, and they walk humbly up to the professor with their heads down. They say, Professor Sproul, you know, we didn't make the adjustment from high school to college very well, and we weren't thinking about this and that that were going on over the weekend, and we got sidetracked, and we are so sorry. Please, please, please give us an extension. Let us turn it in late. And he said, you know, you don't deserve a late, uh, you don't deserve an extension. They said, we, we know. He said, you know, I would be completely just to give you a zero right now. They said, yes. He said, okay, I will give you two more days to turn it in. So turn it in on Wednesday or whatever. He said, all, all, spontaneously, all the students broke uh, into applause. They started singing spontaneously. They were, oh, he, was, I was, he said, I was very popular. Then, then, then the next month, okay, the next month goes by. September, October, the 20th, the paper is due. This time, he said, uh, out of the 200 students, he said something like 200 and, uh, I think it was like 230 or something, had turned in their papers in like 70 I'm getting the numbers all messed up. 130 had turned their papers in, like 70 had not turned their papers in. He says, okay, uh, what am I supposed to do? So they all come over to him, and they're they're all, they're very, very sad again. They they have their heads down, nervous, and they say, listen, uh, this is the last time this will ever happen, and and this is unacceptable. But we, once again, we we did not, we did not do our paper on time. There was, you know, there was a big, there was a thing over the weekend. There was a party. There was a celebration. We, 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 We messed up. We messed, please, please, please. He says, okay, one more time. I don't deserve to give you anything but an F right now. Do you agree? Yes, we know. You made that clear. Okay. I will give you an extension, but listen, don't let it happen again. I will not give you an extension again. This is it, okay? They said, yes, that's right. And then he said, they broke into a song, and the the, the lyrics were, we love you, Prof. Sproul. Oh, yes, we do. And they sang that over and over again. And he said, I was the most popular professor on my campus until November 20th showed up or whatever the day was. He said, then in November, the, the paper was due. He said, this time, 50 people showed up with their papers ready, and 150, the vast majority of his students, walked up to him casually and said, Professor Sproul, don't worry about it. I'll get the paper to you in a couple of days, is what they said. We'll get it to you in a couple of days, no big deal. And he stopped, and he called out the first one. He's like, Smith, did you not turn in your paper? He said, that's right. He said, okay, pulled out, he said, a black book at the time. He pulled out the the black book, which no one wanted to see, and he he wrote F down. And he called out, Johnson, did you not turn your paper? Yeah, okay, F down. He started calling out one after another. He said, when he got to the third or fourth name, all the students, without any preparation ahead of time, all of them shouted at the same time. You know what they shouted? That's not fair. And he, said, he looked over at one of them. He said, uh, excuse me, did you just say that's not fair? He said, yeah. He said, okay, if I remember correctly, you also did not turn your paper in on time last month. Is that correct? The guy said, yes. He said, okay, I'm going to go back to your paper last month. I'm going to give you an F for that one too. He said, would anyone else in the room like justice right now? And he said, everyone in that moment, he said, held their peace. They were just, no, we're not going to argue. We're going to all be quiet now. And he said, what happened in that story is an example, not of some college students, it's an example of human nature. And this is a profound point. I mean, I think, I know many of you have heard this story before, but if we can get this point driven down deep into our own, uh, into our own bloodstream, I think it could make a profound difference. Here's what he said. The first time we fail and we are desperate for grace, we kind of understand what grace is and what justice is. Justice is an F, grace is we get an extension. 
And we, we kind of get it. And we beg for mercy. And if we're given mercy, we are so thrilled and thankful. And maybe the second time, we're equally thrilled. But here's what happens. Because of our fallen human nature, we start growing accustomed to grace. And we start thinking that the bottom line is not justice. The bottom line is grace. It's that what, that's what we actually deserve. And so whenever God gives us justice rather than grace, we get angry at God. And we say, God, how could you let that happen? What have you done? Why would you do that? Not realizing that we've been living, presuming that what we deserve is the grace that we've been experiencing on a daily basis. And what this parable is meant to sort of show us is to say, hey, when God lavishes His grace over here, and He lavishes His grace over here, let's not get into the comparison game. Let's not fall prey to saying, well, God seems to have given more grace to this person than to me, or that person didn't seem to have worked as hard as maybe I think I did. Don't fall prey to that, because you're, you're starting to think that you deserve the grace that you're getting. But none of us deserve grace. That's what it means to be grace. I can almost hear Sproul say in my mind, you know, if you think you deserve grace, go back to the dictionary and read what grace is again. It's not something you deserve by definition. And so what we need to see here is, look, we don't deserve to be in God's family. We have been welcomed by Christ into His family. We have been re redeemed by Christ. We should be astonished by the grace we've been given. We should not be comparing grace against grace. We should not be thinking, I deserve better than I've gotten. No, we always deserve less than we get. We're always given better than we deserve. Even the worst thing that's ever happened to you is not worse than you deserve. Christ got what we deserve on the cross, and now we have the freedom to live out of this with a joy and a thanksgiving for the grace that God has given. Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, it is not our faithfulness that saves us. It is not our faithfulness that merits anything good from you. The famous quote from the Puritans is that the only thing we contribute to our salvation is the sin that made it necessary. We do not contribute anything but the sin that is a wage that deserves death. But we know the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God, help us just a little bit more today, to leave today aware of the fact that you treat us far, far, far better than we deserve. And that if we want to see what we deserve, we should look to Jesus on the cross. Because what we deserve is the image of Christ we have on the cross. Blood-stained, abandoned by God, experiencing God's wrath on that cross, that's what we deserve. Anything short of that, and we are infinitely short of that, we, we are not anywhere close to that for those who know Christ, we never will be, is infinite grace. It is grace that is greater than all of our sin. It is grace that overflows and spills over in our life in countless ways. So help us to be more grateful and less entitled. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.